Hello and welcome to another A Tippling Philosopher video with myself, Jonathan M. S. Pierce. Uh, welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, I'm particularly excited today uh, to speak to Joe Smith, who is of Majesty of Reason renown as a YouTube channel uh, and also a book. Uh, this book here, everyone should go and buy it. It's really reasonable. I'll, I'll plug it later. Um, uh, and there's an interesting thing going on here. As many of you will know, I have multiple sclerosis, and uh, that effectively means that my day to day is the best day of that my brain will ever be for the rest of my life. Okay, so I'm on cognitive decline. So I, in in the mountain of philosophy, I am falling like a Sisyphean rock. Okay. Whereas Joe is a meteor. No, because they come down. So he's going to be a shooting star in the world of philosophy. And I can see him just above there as I roll back down the hill. And I'm like, God damn, you're so young and clever and knowledgeable. And I'm losing it all. I can't remember what I'm doing from one day to the next. Uh, and so um, he makes me very jealous. Um, uh, but in a good way, because it, this is fantastic. This is fantastic for the future of philosophy of religion. It's just super exciting to have him on. So, look, Joe, welcome. Thanks so much for agreeing to come on. Yeah, I'm looking forward to this. And yeah, thank you for the kind words. I really do appreciate it. Yeah, no, no problem at all. And uh, I have to say, so Joe, Joe's got this book, A Short Guide to the Critical Think to Critical Thinking in Philosophy, The Majesty of Reason. I just recently went on holiday to Turkey, and I was sitting by the pool where everyone else is like reading their flash books or, or like trash novels or crime detective novels in their skimpy like budgie smugglers or bikinis and I'm sit sitting there pasty English guy reading a bloody you know <laughs> formal logic <laughs> and going, just being an absolute geek uh, so thanks for that um Joe would you like to introduce yourself uh before we talk about kind of actually more basically where you've come from yeah so uh like you like you intimated in the introduction, um, I do popular and scholarly level work in philosophy. So on the popular level, I have my YouTube channel, Majesty of Reason. I've got a blog by the same name. Uh, and, you know, you can follow me on all the social media platforms. I actually have a friend who manages a lot of my social media stuff because I'm not the biggest fan of social media. It's very toxic. But um, <laughs> uh, what about the scholarly level, well, I publish books and papers. So yeah, you can check out my Phil Papers profile. I do work in philosophy of religion, metaphysics, and philosophy of time. Um, I guess my next big thing coming out is uh, is a book called Existential Inertia and Classical Theistic Proofs. It's coming out with Springer, and it is co-authored with uh, Daniel Linford. He's a, a philosopher who recently um, got his PhD from Purdue, which is where I recently graduated as well. So yeah, it's it's on various different arguments specifically for a classical theistic god. So that's like the God of Aquinas, Anselm, Augustine, etc. So yeah, uh, I don't we know will, when it's... We will, yeah, we will return to classical theism a bit later because I'm absolutely obsessed with Omnigod, as I call yeah. it. The, the iteration which, you know, I talk about and spam my own book. So 30 Arguments Against the Existence of God, Heaven, Hell, Satan, and Divine Design. Uh, please everyone go out and buy 58 copies of that. Um, uh, and you don't have to read it. Uh, and uh, so I'm really interested in what, what you think of that, those ideas of those omni characteristics. But anyway, sorry, back to you. And uh, so you are now. I, I saw that on on your Facebook today about about that book. So that's really exciting. Um, what what are your plans going forward as far as philosophy uh, is concerned? Yeah. So right now I'm in my gap year. I recently graduated from Purdue with my undergrad, and uh, yeah, I'm going to be applying to grad schools uh, in a couple of months. So that's what's up next. Uh, in terms of yeah, scholarly research, I'm doing a, a fun project, which I can't say more about, but I'm doing a fun project on ontological arguments right now with respect to my research. And also um, just, you know, writing papers on different topics in uh, philosophy of time, paradoxes, causal finitism, infinity, things like that. So yeah. All, all, the, fun, all the fun stuff. Yes, exactly. Uh, I and uh, I suggest everyone goes and checks out his uh, YouTube channel. It's, it's an absolute gold mine for philosophy of religion. And uh, I don't know of anyone else that's done a 12 hour video of like <laughs> all the arguments against God answered. Uh, <laughs> uh, sorry, all the arguments for the existence of God answered. Uh, so yeah, talk, talk us through just a little bit of the impetus behind that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so I had just graduated. I'm like, I, I got to do something fun for graduation. Uh, yeah, I got to celebrate somehow. So I'll make a big video. Um, 
And I don't know, I'd been meaning to, uh, I've been meaning to go through in some manner that Capturing Christianity video where they present over 150 arguments for God's existence. It's like a four and a half hour live stream um, because, I, well, there are a bunch of different reasons. Firstly, I do think it's a valuable video um, for people basically pointing people to different research uh, areas where they can pursue arguments in depth. Uh, and so I, I was like, okay, uh, we've got we've got a nice video that summarizes some of the arguments for God's existence. Well, why don't we also have a video which is well-researched and pretty rigorous, which summarizes some of the major responses to those arguments. I thought that was needed. So I was like, okay, I'll, I'll make that. <laughs> and so yeah, bada bing, bada boom, 12 hours later, um, the re recording. I yeah, go I on. Love it. I, I, was just gonna say, I love it. Four and a half hours, hold my beer. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah, um, that's weak sauce. Brilliant. Uh, so let's let's take a step back into the world of Joe Schmidt. And, and I'm interested, you are, and we'll talk about your agnosticism later, um, but you are an agnostic who is interested in debating all of these things, very interested in philosophy. But who were you growing up? What sort of family did you grow up in? in were you fortuitous enough or unlucky enough to be born into? Uh, and how did that inform sort of your, your path that you've taken? Yeah, well, very fortuitous, very privileged, very lucky. Uh, <laughs> just want to emphasize those at the outset. Um, yeah, so I was raised in a, a devout Catholic home, uh, Catholic primary. I went to Catholic primary school, Catholic secondary school, uh, private, things like that. Um, even though our family is, uh, you know, kind of middle class, my, my parents really, really stressed education and things like that, which is I'm, you know, immensely grateful to them for that. Um, so yeah, we had theology classes basically every day, which is similar to philosophy of religion. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, that kind of got me thinking in ph broadly philosophical, theological terms. Uh, and then in fourth grade, I got like a little iPod touch. And, you know, uh, in addition to all the gamings, like the games that we, I bought, you know, there's like Doodle Jump and Angry Birds and things like that. Uh, you know, all the cool kids are downloading Instagram. So I got Instagram. And uh naturally enough, you know, I was interested in debating and things like that. So I went on different forums and I debated and it was like paragraphs upon paragraphs. So this is like fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh grade and things like that. So I was just really in, into it. And uh, yeah, there were like substantive discussions. Like I remember like it wasn't just like poo flinging. It was a uh, it was substantive. You know, there was a, uh, you know, just random strangers. But, you know, they were interested in debating, too. And, you know, usually it was pretty cordial and uh, professional, as it were. Um, so yet, uh, like, what? OK, but where was your worldview? along this journey like uh, because it, when you're young there's a tendency you know we look at evolutionary uh, theories to take on what your elders say and then you, you kind of believe that unflinchingly but at some point you grew up enough to be able to start challenging these things where, when, when was that for you and what were the things that that made you go hmm because you're not a, a, a you know a very um conservative or at least a very fundamental uh catholic so where did, what happened yeah, so in seventh or eighth grade, so thankfully Catholics are very um, open to science. So in seventh and eighth grade, you know, we learned about evolution. Our class literally watched the Ken Ham versus Bill Nye debate because that's 2014. So those of you who wow. know your, those of you who know your math know that I was in like seventh or eighth grade then. <laughs> so uh, we literally watched it, uh, and we had to like write an essay. And this is in our science class, you know. So we had to like write an essay on it and talk about even how it relates to Genesis and things. It was super cool. Um, so that got me interested in evolution, and I actually minored in. Uh, biology. Uh, so that kind of, that sparked an interest in evolution for me. I just thought it was so magnificent that, uh, you know, we came from these such uh, simple, humble origins. I thought it was beautiful. Um, but then, of course, in eighth, ninth-ish grade, I started seeing the negative aspects of evolution as well. So in addition to the beauty and elegance of, you know, simple forms giving rise to complex forms, there's also the, you know, pretty crappy aspects of evolution, like animals tearing each other to shreds, predation, parasitism, all that not so fun stuff. And so that really pierced my mind and heart, as I put it in my uh, in the preface to my forthcoming book. And uh, yeah, so that really, that really bothered me. So this is like ninth ish grade when I really started thinking about that. And of course, I started researching that I went online, I found um, secular outposts, I found, you know, internet infidels, I found and all the theist side as well I was looking at BioLogos and William Lane Craig and like all these different resources. And then I was just consuming them. And you know, once you get into philosophy, there's really no going back from there. So yes, it was well, mainly were, the were evolutionary you, sorry, but Were you committed, though, to like a belief in, in a God? Like, were you at the time, a, like a Catholic? Yeah, so you you interjected at the perfect point because that's all what right. I was about to do. No, it's all good. All right. um, so yeah, uh, it was about ninth ish grade where 
a lot of these problems started to, to creep up or crop up. And it was mainly evolutionary suffering that really got at me. But um, yeah, in roughly ninth ish grade, you know, there's this vague transition from uh, Catholic to agnostic and then eventually metaphysical naturalist. So atheist, uh, but specifically metaphysical naturalist. Cause you know, I was like reading the work of Paul Draper and uh, yes. Jeff Louder and uh, got into all that stuff. Jeff Louder kind of popularized his stuff and brought it down to a level that I could understand uh, at that age. And so, yeah, I went, I became a, you know, pretty robust metaphysical naturalist at like roughly between ninth and 10th grade. Uh, and then, you know, going, going to agnosticism, uh, in about 11th grade, 11th to 12th grade, uh, I stumbled upon the work of Josh Rasmussen. I found his YouTube videos and I was like, whoa, uh, this guy's got some really interesting arguments. I'm going to reach out to him, uh, you know, test some of my objections to Can you explain uh, who he is to, to the viewers. Yeah. So Josh Rasmussen is a philosopher at Azusa Pacific University. He's done a lot of work in lots of different areas in philosophy, like metaphysics and um, specifically philosophy of religion as well. So he has done stuff on capturing Christianity and others, but he's principally a, a philosopher. Uh, he's, uh, but he, he gets interested in these sorts of worldview discussions, uh, theism, atheism, and um, all these different sorts of things. And he, he's published a lot on cosmological arguments and ontological arguments and things like that. And so, and he also has a YouTube channel, Worldview Design. I think it might now be just Joshua Rasmussen. He might've changed it. But anyway, he's got this old stock of videos that I binged watched. Uh, and yeah, I reached out to him and we had like hundreds of emails back and forth on worldviews and atheism, atheism, things like that. So uh, he was also pretty uh, important uh, for getting me back to a kind of state of agnosticism. I picked up his book with Proust, uh, which is ne called Necessary Existence. And, you know, there are some pretty powerful arguments in there for the existence of like a foundational necessary being. Uh, and so all these sorts of different considerations pulled me back to agnosticism. Interesting. Um, and just another bit of spam talking about Jeff Lauder. So Josh Rasmus Rasmussen is a Christian. Uh, Jeff Lauder um, wrote the forward to my book on the Kalam cosmological argument. So, right. you know, thanks, Jeff. Uh, what uh, did God create the universe from nothing? And the answer is just, just in case you're wondering, probably not. Um, uh, so <laughs> anyway, you know, to <laughs> TLDR uh, version. Um, so, OK. What do you think that upbringing gave you in terms of the tools that you are now bringing or you were bringing, have been bringing to, to the debates to philosophy? Great, great question. Well, one of them is definitely just a love for truth. Um, uh, my parents instilled that in me. My Catholic primary and secondary education instilled that in me. Various mm -hmm. teachers that I had throughout the years instilled that in me. They instilled a love for learning. So I get those are the two main things, love of truth and a love of learning. Um, and yeah, those are the main, I mean, I guess those are the main things, but, uh, I mean, what else? I mean, of course, you know, we're all to some degree products of our, uh, intellectual milieu. So, uh, you know, I probably inherited lots of different intuitions from that. So like intuitions that strongly favor moral realism, that's, you know, favor, uh, you know, we all just have different evaluative dispositions that take us into philosophy. You know, some people are, have a more austere kind of view. They like anomalism. They like moral anti-realism. They like all these anti-realist views. There are other people who have more. That's me. <laughs> other people have a more um, expansive ontology where they want to get as much explanatory bang for their buck as they can, and they're willing to postulate things. Um, uh, I, you know, I, I don't quite know where I fall in that, but I fall more towards the ba explanatory bang for your buck. So, you know, I'm fine with abstract objects. I'm fine with like irreducible mentality. I'm fine, you know. Um, so I don't know. I probably got cert certain evaluative dispositions from that. Um, yeah. You ever look at some of those things or, or where, you're, where you're at now and go, okay, this is a product of where I've come from sort of psychosocially. Uh, I need to question this more. Do you know what I mean? Are you ever like, do you ever have moments of self awareness and self reflection to to think, oh, I'm not too sure about this. This could be a product of of psychology rather than rationality. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's it's always a looming factor, just given human given humans, right? We all have confirmation bias. We all have so many different biases, uh, including biases for inculcated from an early age and so on. So, I always try to be aware of that and try to mitigate it as best as I can and try to objectively analyze things because I do think that there are good arguments for these various views that I have and so on. So, but yes, that's always an omnipresent threat. Yeah, I mean, fair cop. So, I mean, you you mentioned that you are agnostic, and obviously, that's gonna take up a little bit of conversation here let's let's think about that so why uh why why agnosticism and not atheism or theism yeah so i mean i guess we could probably 
uh, here's how I understand the terms uh, before yeah, we get yeah, into that. Yeah, let's talk the terms. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so as I understand it, a theist is one who believes in God or gods. Uh, an atheist is one who believes that there are no gods and no God. Uh, and then an ag agnostic is someone who suspends judgment on the question. Uh, they neither believe that there is a God or gods, uh, nor do they believe that there are no God or gods. Uh, yeah, what are you going to say? Well, yeah, no. OK, but I think it's probably worth unpicking atheism as well, because a lot of people I have arguments with. I'm a strong atheist. OK, I actually I'm an agnostic atheist. It depends on where whether we're talking epistemically or whatever. But, you know, it, for all intents and purposes, and this is something I want to talk to you about, actually, uh, about uh, practical definitions and technical definitions, if you like. Um, so but atheism is something that I disagree with a lot of other atheists about who say it's a lack of belief. It's like, no, you wouldn't be arguing to toss on the Internet for 20 hours a day just about something that you lack a belief in like you <laughs> you you believe god doesn't exist right so this is the difference i don't know if you want to explain that to the viewers the difference between strong atheism and weak atheism or positive and negative atheism yes <laughs> and they'll also like post memes comparing god to santa claus and like the easter bunny it's like you guys obviously don't lack belief in these things you obviously believe that they don't exist <laughs> so it's like okay but anyway um i've kind of uh become disillusioned with, I'm going to be honest with you, I've kind of become disillusioned with this sort of debate because I feel that it polarizes people more than, yeah. I think it generates more heat than light, honestly. Um, yeah. So he, how, here's how I kind of just go about these sorts of discussions. I just tell people what I mean by the terms and uh, they can tell me what they mean. And honestly, let's just find some common ground and then let's talk yeah. about the issues. So um, I mean, personally, I don't, I don't like that because in philosophy, the, the under the, the usage of the terms is the way that I specified them. And there are various reasons for that. You know, if you want to say atheism is a lack of belief, you're kind of, um, you're not carving out a distinctive space for agnostics, et cetera. Uh, but you know, we can set those worries aside because like I said, I think it generates more heat than light. <laughs> yeah. So, so your, ver your version of atheism, oh, sorry, agnosticism, what, how would you define that then? Oh yeah. Yeah. No, this is good because um, like the bare definition of agnosticism that I was just given doesn't give us insight into the precise reason why, the, I guess the broad reason why they are, they are an agnostic, right? So an agnostic, like I said, is someone who suspends judgment on whether or not God or gods exist. Um, they don't believe either way. Uh, but then there's a the question, right? Which is, I think what you're hinting at, uh, which is like, well, why, right? Is it because they think that you can't know in principle? Or is it because they think that there are no reasons either way for or against the existence of God? Uh, or do they think that there are lots of reasons on both sides, uh, but they just roughly counterbalance? So um, I don't go the I don't go the route of saying you can't know in principle or things like that. Um, I think, you know, if you just have like a sound deductive argument showing that God exists or God doesn't exist, that's a perfectly fine way to come to know. Um, but uh, the, the, the camp that I fall into is an agnostic of the sort that says, uh, well, actually, there are lots of reasons on both sides. And they roughly, very roughly counterbalance something along those lines. Um, so, and, and, you know, because they counterbalance, you suspend judgment on the matter. You don't go one way or the other. Um, so yeah, that's the basic thrust. Uh, now, of course, if people want the specific reasons, you know, how long do we have? Do we have, you know, 73 hours to go into? I mean, um, I mean, I probably need more than that, honestly, but, uh, yeah, I mean, they could check out my channel if they're interested in that. I have a specific video on this, which is at this point kind of dated, but also, um, it, it does get into some of the reasons. Why am I an agnostic? It's one of my favorite videos, so I recommend che people checking that out. Um, but also, I mean, watching that 12 hour long video will give them a glimpse because occasionally I will say, hey, I think this argument is evidence for God's existence. Cool. Uh, but other ones I'll be like, well, actually, I think that there's a strong consideration against God's existence here. You know, so th they'll get a sense of um, my epistemic state by watching that 12 hour video too. So, so you think roughly 50-50 uh or i know this is so like it's reductionist. Difficult. Yeah, yeah yeah so it is difficult you know assigning a precise probability i i used to be a little bit more gung-ho about that but um i've come to have some more reservations about assigning such precise probabilities yeah. i mean we could probably do it in terms of ranges i'd be more comfortable yeah. with that but i mean that's why i just say i just talk about the reasons themselves and where i think they roughly fall so i i mean maybe uh maybe Maybe my evidence is like incommensurable with one another. I don't know. Maybe certain pieces of evidence that I have for one side just can't be compared with the other side. So maybe I can't give a precise probability estimate for both sides. Um, so yeah, I, I've I've come to have some worries about that. Um, but yeah, I just say roughly, uh, roughly counterbalanced. And and this may be um, uh, just a bastardization of the term. But are you atheistic, for example, over the Christian God? Do you know what I mean? Is is your is your oh like, yeah. Your kind of agnosticism about uh, a kind of necessary being, which is a, a, a more generally theistic idea rather than the specific. 
going. Good. Excellent question. So yeah, when I um when I say God, usually I mean just this kind of traditional monotheism. That's kind of what I mean, where it's the triomnes basically, and then just added a few other things. So it's just like a, a perfect being, it's necessarily existent, it's the creator of at least every concrete thing apart from itself. And yeah, it's omnipotent, omniscient, uh, morally perfect, uh, or omnibenevolent. So that's a, it's kind of just basic core traditional monotheism that I'm talking about. Uh, with respect to like a polytheistic pantheon, things like that, I'm an, you know, an atheist towards those. I disbelieve. I think that they don't exist. Um, and to other, you know, perhaps more precise characterizations of God, I will like strongly disbelieve in them. So for instance, if someone has a... Um, uh, a fundamentalist characterization of Christianity where God, you know, genuinely commanded genocide in the Old Testament, you know, if they have that kind of view. Uh, no, I think that that's, well, I don't know how strong I should go, but I think that that's obviously false. So, um, you know, it, it kind of varies depending on the characterization. Um, yeah, that's, that's really interesting. Um, so, well, let, let's talk a little bit about unnecessary entity. Um, because I sometimes wonder when people present the argument that, you know, God is this necessary being, uh, and then assuming that this is what some, well, this is what some theists say, and I'm going to choose this version for discussion. So you've got a necessary being that causally prior to the creation of the universe. So this being is therefore not, not existing in time. You've got a kind of tenseless, atemporal existence. And then a la William Craig, Lane Craig, you know, enters into time in creating uh, space time. So, but if you, you're a necessary being that without time, you don't have time to deliberate, to choose, to have any of those personhood uh, like aspects, you, you, cre you create. So actually there's no decision. It's just in instantaneous creation. Is not creation as equally as necessary as the being itself okay good question so there are a few things we can disentangle here so firstly um i mean i'm kind of agnostic on whether or not the past is infinite or finite so i mean the model that you were just sketching kind of assumes a finite past yeah. uh, but i mean i'm kind of agnostic on that question i mean okay fine if i had to bet if i had to bet i'd say finite past i mean it'd probably be like 60 40 or something but i really don't think that the arguments for the finitude of the past uh are all that strong uh, but, you know, let's just set that aside. Um, because if it's an infinite past, well, then you don't really get into this problem. I mean, God, God, or it, the necessary being is just in some sense continually undergirding creation, right? Or whatever is the non-fundamental contingent thing. So uh, it's not as though... But in, in what sense could it be then contingent? Oh, yeah. So I guess we can set aside the considerations about time because, you know, the necessary things relation to time or God's relation to time would get us into really sticky and tricky uh, territory. So then, yes, let's focus on this this question of modal collapse. Um, I mean, the basic solution that uh, I think is at least uh, serviceable, <laughs> coherent, workable, uh, is that you know there's just an indeterministic explanatory link between the necessary thing and the contingent things. So a, a deterministic link would be um, between A and B would be that in any world in which A exists, B would also exist, or a, in any world in which A occurs, B would also occur. But an indeterministic explanatory link would involve B in some sense depending on A, but there can be worlds in which A exists without B existing as well. Uh, so the, the A doesn't necessitate the B. So the cause or the ground or the explanation doesn't necessitate or render inevitable the effect. Uh, it rather we could just say maybe it just raises the probability that it occurs or somehow or other it indeterministically explains it. There are different models of that, right? One of them is a kind of libertarian free will. But another one, I mean, we we have physical models. I'm not saying that these are true physical models, but we at least have coherent models of indeterministic physical causation, right? You have earlier states which uh, don't necessarily give rise to a specific later state. Instead, they only probabilistically give rise to that state, and they have different probabilities for different states. Uh, this is afforded in certain interpretations of quantum mechanics. Again, I'm not saying that they're true, but they offer us a coherent model. So uh, basically, you could just say that uh, the necessary thing indeterministically causes um, its effects or things but like that. But that only works on the model where the universe is, is you know, infinite into the past. If, if, you, if you retreat to the God as a necessary being in God world existing without anything, which kind of doesn't make sense because it's an instantaneous like creation of the universe is is that version i suppose what i'm arguing against is kind of a, a, 
a Christian theistic argument that said God exists in God world and then creates the universe. But if God is necessary, and this is where we're going to get onto an, uh, a discussion about best possible worlds, but if God is necessary and then decides to create the universe but it's the best universe you could create is like do you know what i mean it's, it's like it's almost like this is almost a part of god and therefore it's equally kind of necessary there is no world in which if this is the best possible world then there's no world that this could not exist in does that make sense yeah i mean so this is a so i just want to say at the outset this is a totally reasonable set of worries right so um you know theologians and philosophers have been discussing this this problem as you know for like thousands of years so this is definitely not like a I just want people to recognize that this is not just like some fringe problem that you've come up with, right? So this, no, is, no. this, is, this is a pretty serious, um, pretty serious challenge, and there are lots of pretty serious answers to the challenge, right? So, I mean, again, the basic theistic response, or at least the basic Christian theistic response, who want to maintain God's freedom, is they're going to want to say that God has libertarian freedom among a different range of options. So there are a bunch of different range of options, and then um, God can either timelessly select one, and then <laughs> that's a bit weird because timelessness is difficult to understand. Um, but or, you know, um, God might exist pre-exist the beginning of metric time in a non-metric or amorphous time. So it's still a temporal moment. Uh, and then he decides in that um, uh, that temporal moment prior to the beginning of metric time uh, after. Uh, well, yeah, after surveying the range of options, as it were, and choosing one among those. So I think they'd appeal to libertarian freedom. Now, you do raise this question about the best possible world. I mean, that's a separate argument from how how we could at least get some kind of contingency. And I think just that the contingency worry is going to be appealed. Or they're going to try to appeal to libertarian freedom to avoid that. Uh, but I think different appeals need to be made to avoid the best possible world problem. So I think these are separate problems. It's up to you which one we want to dwell on. Okay. Well, very well, we'll come to the best possible worlds. But libertarian free will, I mean, I, I am... Uh, not a libertarian free willer. Uh, I, I think it's an incoherent concept. And I'm going to hit you with something else concerning that in a bit. But um, what are your thoughts on that? Because if libertarian free will is philosophically incoherent, then obviously that option is, is you know, dead in the water. Yeah, so they're in a bit of a sticky situation if libertarian free will is incoherent. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I, I think I agree with you. I mean, they're, they're going to have to go some kind of compatibilist route. Uh, and they're going to want to say that, yeah, I mean, um, if God has a range of options, he's not going to be able to have control over which of those options come about because then he'd have libertarian freedom. So then it would either be some kind of accidental burping out of some creation as opposed to another, which they don't want to say because uh, that's not God's providence, right? So then they're going to have to say, yeah, God does necessarily create. Um, that is, again, assuming that um, the libertarian free will is incoherent. And that's a you know a pretty hefty assumption. But um yeah, yeah I, I think it's one of my personal opinion is one of the I mean, it's a huge area of philosophy. My first book was on free will. But um, I yeah, I just I, the, as you kind of intimated there, you either get, you know, something that's causally something that's caused or uncaused. Right. There, there's no middle ground. There's just like cause, cause causation or is cause or not caused. Uh, and something that's not caused, you know causally determined is is therefore random and random is not the 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 good bedfellow of libertarian free will and so i i, I can't see a, a way out of that i i don't know if you have yeah i mean it's it's so difficult because yeah like you said these questions have garnered so much attention from philosophy yeah. Uh, yeah. so i mean the, again the general libertarian response is going to be uh yeah so we've uncaused and caused but within the caused right we could distinguish between the deterministically caused and the indeterministically caused and they're going to want to say that libertarian freedom falls into that indeterministically caused so there's still causation going on there's still dependence of the effect upon the cause but it's not as though the, the effect is necessitated by the cause or rendered inevitable by the cause so it, it allows for that kind of leeway between different options um but, but what can indeterministically caused even mean if it's not random well that is the challenge facing uh, libertarians and uh, i mean they're going to want to say that uh, the difference between sheer randomness and uh, an indeterministically caused libertarian free choice let's say is that the the latter is based on various reasons based on various desires based on various motives um it's uh yeah, I mean that. I mean that's what <laughs> it looks yeah. very much like causal determinism to me. But yeah, yeah I mean they're just going to want to say that uh, those reasons and motives, like he, he God had a, a set of reasons, and motives favoring one outcome, but he also had a set of reasons and motives favoring another outcome, and and upon deliberation, one of those is settled. Um, but, but of course, uh, the question is like upon deliberation, what does that mean? And surely that's your causal determination that's going on there. They're going to say it's yeah, an because... indeterministic causal process. <laughs> 
No. Well, okay. yeah, so I, I just, and in fact, I, I fundamentally can't understand um, indeterminate causation, or at least, uh, so I wrote in, I wrote an essay years back when I was doing my master's, and um, it's now in a chapter, another bit, bit of spam opportunity, now in the chapter, why I am atheist and not a theist. You see what I did there, very clever wordplay. Um, and uh, th that is, I call the argument from format, and it's the idea that, you wouldn't have existence if you didn't have a deterministic framework within which that existence is set. Because as soon as something isn't working strictly to rules, it will decohere. And and actually, I would say the same to it for a soul and for anything that's non-material. Like even including, uh, I'd include God with this. Like unless there are things that are are keeping God in the structure of being God, so that God is recognizable as God then what's to say it wouldn't decohere? And the same with, with any kind of reality or any kind of matter or anything, so souls. And, and I just think that the only thing that makes sense is that is a, is a framework of strict causal determination. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm, it depends. So uh, the theist could go divine simplicity. So they could say, God doesn't have any structure. What are you, you know, I'm putting my divine simplicity hat on. Mm. What are you talking about? Yes, I agree with you uh, that things that have that kind of structure need some kind of cause, you know, they need some cause to keep them from decohering, as it were. But that's where God is precisely different, right? God is absolutely simple. He doesn't have any structure. And that's precisely why we can say that he exists uncaused and that he is the uncaused cause of everything else. He needs to be keeping them from decohering. That's one thing that they could say. Um, but can I just go back? And, sorry, I know yeah. I'm cutting you off. I'm really sorry, Joe. Uh, but okay. if, if, if to say that God doesn't have a structure, but God has properties, because God must have properties in order for God to be recognizable. You, you know, properties in an abstract <laughs> sense, uh, as in that God must have recognizable properties so that you can go, that is God and not not God. Yeah, so this is where... Um, uh, I was smiling because this is where classical theism gets interesting. So by, by classical theism, I don't just mean the triomni theism. That, that, I use the term traditional theism for that, but classical theism is very specific in adding various, very high octane theses to that traditional theism. One of them is this divine simplicity. And it's that, okay, the, yeah, there's a sense in which God has properties, but they're all numerically identical to one another and with God himself, right? So it's not as though God is a structure composed of various numerically distinct properties. Um, no, God, God is the good. God is goodness itself. Um, God is numerically identical to his goodness. He's numerically identical to his omniscience and omnipotence and so on. So yes, he does have these quote unquote properties. Uh, and, you know, it's by virtue of that that he can be distinguished from things that aren't omnipotent and aren't, you know, et cetera. Um, but they're all just numerically identical to one another and with God himself. So um, he's just this absolutely what, what simple What do you reality. mean they are numerically identical? What does that mean? Yeah, so they're all just the same thing. They're all just God, you know? So, um, so you know, the is of identity. Oh, yeah, exactly. So uh, you know how Clark Kent is Superman, right? It's there aren't like two beings there, two realities. It's just one reality. Uh, similarly, there's just one reality, God himself, but also, you know, God's omnipotence and also God's omniscience. So it's just that one reality, which is his omniscience, which is his omnipotence, which is himself, etc. It's a bit weird to wrap your mind around, but you know, such is the nature of classical theism and God is transcendent, right? God is um, holy other, right? This is part of his holy other aspect, at least as the classical theists say um lots of people uh find that very odd uh <laughs> so that that's what motivates the need for a non-classical theism uh, lots of other things motivate the need of course but you know that's just one thing uh, so I, I just wanted to flag that as one way that the theist could get around that just by saying no uh, there's nothing that needs to keep god from decohering because he doesn't even have a structure um yeah yeah so uh, that's a good segue on to god's properties of uh, omniscience uh, all knowing uh, omnipotence all, all powerful and omnibenevolence all loving so these are the sort of classic properties of of the characteristics of you know god um at least as we're going to discuss but do they make any sense like do, how do you understand omniscience, omnipotence, and omnibenevolence that actually doesn't get the believer into a, a load of contradictions and hot water? Well, I'm not sure I can avoid the hot water, but uh, I can at least try to uh, try to articulate these for the audience in a clear way. Yeah, so I mean, it's immensely difficult to define these because yeah, there are a bunch of different analyses in the literature, and a lot of them seem to have a little wrinkles that need to be worked out, but. Roughly something like the following, I think, uh, is a good start. 
So uh, omniscience, there are like at least two different ways to define this. So one of them is, so there's one way to define omniscience, knowing all truths with maximal confidence and believing no falsehoods. Okay, so knowing all truths with, match, with maximal confidence and believing no falsehoods. Another way to define it, so this is one that open theists would quite like, um, is that it's knowing all truths that are possible to know and with the highest confidence, which is possible, and believing no falsehoods. So um, those are two different, way, two different ways. And then others will actually include some other stuff in there, like non-propositional knowledge. Uh, for instance, Linda Zizgab, ugh, Linda Zygzebski, philosopher, um, very great philosopher, she would include, for instance, all experiential knowledge. She would say God has all experiential knowledge or all what it is like knowledge. Um, so that's omniscience. Um, so that's interesting because that's an argument that I use in my 30 Arguments Against God book, which is if God has um, experiential knowledge uh, of, of all future events that or all counterfactuals, all things that could happen, then, you know, and that would include it, the experience of creating this world here. And yet this world in in creating this world, you're necessarily creating all sorts of pain and suffering. Then if God could experience that, God wouldn't need to actually create that. It could just experience that in his mind, its mind, and then not create and therefore not create suffering. Good. Excellent question. Yeah. So what the theist is probably going to say in response to that is they're probably going to want to say that there is a certain goodness that's lost there, namely the goodness of like they're really being creatures out there and really undergoing this kind of um, drama of uh, of um, growing in love and growing in virtue and overcoming tragedy and um, yeah, just this this grand story. It's similar to the experience machine. I mean, I wouldn't I wouldn't plug into the experience machine. I just put an experience yeah. machine, and it's not just going to go off on one. But yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I wouldn't I wouldn't myself get into the experience machine. Um, I, I think there's I certain I think there's certain values of really interacting with the world and really coming to have knowledge of what things are really like in themselves and um, really being really... simulated that one to one almost. Well, yeah, then uh, yeah, I don't yeah, know. I mean, you're we're just you're missing out on the genuine relationship aspect, like the genuineness of it, the real aspect to it. Uh, and I just think that's missing out on certain values that uh, you would wouldn't have if you plugged in things like that. No, they're not genuine. Huh? You wouldn't know they're not genuine. Exactly. You wouldn't know that you're missing out on something that's very valuable. So, so what? I mean, you're still missing out on it. I mean, <laughs> yeah, so, but, but I think, you know, you don't even know that you're experiencing them now. So like that you're not in the matrix. So I, I don't know that that's, that's a meaningful thing to say. Well, uh, I do possibly. know that. Well, I'm just going to go out on a limb here. I do know that I have hands, and if I have hands, then I'm not in the matrix. So I do know that I'm not in the matrix. Uh, <laughs> uh, okay, I don't. It's have really to... easy. Yeah. So You've what just you... done it. No, but but what you were meaning is I'm not certain in that. So I'm not certain that I'm in the matrix. I grant you that. Um, so yeah. But I don't know. If there's any practical difference? Uh, I guess is what I'm saying. Like you know, because the, the to to miss out on something is almost to take an objective third person point of view of things. But, but actually, to be that subjective person, you wouldn't know the difference between the two. And therefore, if you don't know the difference between the two, then there is no value difference. See, I would reject that last inference. If you don't know the difference, then there is no value difference. I mean... Uh, well, value is subjective to you. Well, I don't, you might I don't be... think so. All no, right, I mean, so... I mean, well, I mean, one thing is like, I mean, suppose that... Uh... Unbeknownst to unbeknownst to you, well, maybe I shouldn't use you, but I, maybe I maybe I will. Unbeknownst to you, your wife has been cheating on you for like twenty years or something. Um, you know, unbeknownst. I mean, hey, you don't know about it. There's all practically the same, but still, there's a value there that that's missing <laughs> in your life. Like unbeknownst to you, this this terrible thing has been occurring. Uh, but even though it makes no practical difference to you, and I think that's a good example of um, even if something makes no practical difference, even if we're unaware of it, there can still be. Uh, various goods and bads of which we're unaware that still influence how our life goes like your life is worse even if you don't know it and you're, it's practically irrelevant your life is still worse that your wife has been cheating on you for the past yeah years. i think that's dis disanalogous though I, I don't think that's i think that's a false analogy personally because i, I think that that that's taking uh, not being knowledgeable of of like a set of events of things that have actually happened whereas uh, as it you know this is this is going back to like the experience machine where, where everything like everything is, is, is simulated and therefore it's your reality. It's everyone's reality. There is no other reality. Uh, well, there's an, I suppose an objective reality of people sitting in a, in a, yeah, that's what I was going to say <laughs> that that is the reality that we're comparing it with. 
but but that you know if if god is um you know sitting sitting back there and experiencing everything without having to uh to create it then there is no creation of suffering and if we are created we are suffering um and uh, i you know yeah we're not going to be ex experienced in things but we're also not going to be experiencing suffering i suppose the argument would would come down to uh, is there a net good is there a net yes good? exactly exactly and i think what the, the so that's that's i think that's the diagnosis and what the theist is going to want to say is yes there is a net good right so um even though there's going to be suffering uh, that suffering is going to be redeemed it's going to be uh, ultimately justified and defeated um for each of the individual sufferers perhaps in an afterlife um but per, for some people perhaps in this life right they'll experience certain soul building soul growth etc um uh but I'm, yeah i'm interesting you said perhaps in the afterlife because i often say this and i don't see if you agree or disagree but i find the afterlife a really problematic um mechanism that theists use to just to morally justify bad things okay so a six month old gets cancer it's okay they have a eternity in heaven that's to me that's moral that's compensation and not moral justification so if i punch you in the face and broke your jaw and then gave you ten thousand dollars like my ten thousand dollars is to compensate for the moral abhorrence of breaking your jaw it doesn't make your breaking your jaw morally good unless you adhere to a strict form of consequentialism which i don't think theists generally do so therefore the use of the afterlife as a as a moral justifier is an is an invalid move i'd say w would you agree i think it i think it depends on what the theist is using it for so in many cases i do think that it's uh it's very problematic for the reason that you said right that kind of almost flippant attitude to suffering is extremely uh distasteful and should should be avoided uh and you know especially if they're trying to say like the very fact of you know goods in an afterlife means that the suffering somehow wasn't good or it's somehow lessening of the suffering itself but i think a better way to develop this line of response is that um like god knows before the foundations of the world that um for the people that he's putting the suffering through uh that's they're going to come to recognize their that suffering and recognize its role in their life and um not endorse the suffering as such qua suffering because it's evil but they're still going to endorse their lives and they're going to say that yes my life was worth it because that suffering was interwoven into my character in such a way that um that my life was redeemed or certain aspects of my life were redeemed were uh better overall because of it's you know something along those lines so they can still say that the suffering itself was bad but they can say that I still affirm my life and I, I affirm my existence and things like that um, because that suffering was interwoven into my life in such a way that uh, it was a flourishing life. It was worth living. Uh, and so in that way, it's not as though God is just like using people. He's not, um, you know, he's not, yeah, it's not really this kind of utilitarian calculus, but it's the agent, it's the person centered. It's an agent centered approach. Is, is that still the, the way you describe that to me is God using people instrumentally? It's still using people uh, at certain points in time to achieve a greater good at a different point in time, either for themselves, well, as you'd, you'd say, for each individual, even if it's a six-month-old baby. So uh, it, it, seems, it seems just instrumental to me uh, and therefore, you know, kind of utilitarian, which is fine. Like if, 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 the, if the theist is going to bite the bullet and say, yeah, that's consequentialist, I, I'm cool, I'm a theistic consequentialist, but they gen generally don't. Yeah, I mean, it sort of depends on I don't know it kind of depends like how are we um how are we divvying up who like how are we divvying up to whom the goods are accrued i mean if the good is uh if if the relevant goods and evils are done for the sake of this individual and not for the sake of some larger plan or larger uh you know things outside of them they're not really being used as a as a means i mean you know god's treating them as an end in himself uh because the suffering is not being used um for someone else or anything like that it's it's being interwoven into this own person's life uh for the flourishing of themselves and for the redemption and of themselves so i guess it's god is still treating them as an end in himself and not really so it's okay them. yeah so it's okay to be consequentialist if you are using a person for their own ends so I, i'm not i just i'm questioning whether or not this is yeah, even yeah, consequential. It's interesting. Yeah. no i mean i'm questioning whether or not this is even consequentialist in the first place so it's it's not as though um god's bringing about the evil just for the sake of the great goods that it produces um but he's actualizing a world in which various goods uh, obtain and various goods to individuals obtain and sometimes suffering is going to obtain but um 
God knows that each person is going to endorse their lives and, and things like that. So it's not as though God is like just creating the suffering just for the sake of getting out great goods for it. Um, I mean, I just think he's uh, creating an arena with, with moral creatures in which each of them is going to flourish and endorse their lives uh, because he loves them. And he's not just like doing some utility calculus. Um, uh, and he knows that loving them and them endorsing their lives will have to involve certain uh, greater goods coming about from the suffering, but it's not as though he's bringing about the suffering because he's doing this utilitarian calculus, which doesn't really uh, work with hell, of course, because there is no great. You know, well, hell ruins hell ruins everything, uh, like yeah. in a literal sense. So, like, um, I actually think that lots of the best responses to certain arguments against theism are are just completely gutted if you have hell in the picture, right? Like, yeah. I think you probably need something like a non-hell view, something like a non-hell view in order to properly respond to the, the argument from evil, probably the argument from hiddenness as well, things like that. Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, otherwise, certain people are just thrown under the bus, uh, you know, yeah. and I just think that God, God couldn't be justified in doing that. Um, you know, this just this little girl who is unfortunately uh, killed in a gas chamber at Auschwitz, not a Christian. So I suppose Christianity is true. Uh, not a Christian. Maybe she goes to hell because she didn't affirm Jesus or something along those lines. Like that is absurd. This this girl is her life is being thrown under the bus. That is not okay. You know that suffering that she went through in this life and then in, in the next life. None of that is redeemed. None of it is justified. And if if the goods are accruing to other people, then yes, now she is just a pawn in a game. She is just being used as a mere means to bring about um, uh, goods for other people. I mean, I take a, a person-centered and agent-centered approach. If I were a theist, I would say that um, if an individual person is going to undergo certain suffering, uh, then that needs to be redeemed and just or justified from their own perspective. Yeah, they cannot be used as a mere pawn for someone else. Um, yeah. And uh, if you have this kind of view where people go to hell uh, because they don't accept Jesus or something along those lines, then you lose that constraint, and I think then you lose all plausibility. Which, which appears to show, I, I presume then you would disagree with any theodicy that, that, that invokes a kind of third person utility. So, for example, a soul building theodicy where someone dies of cancer, but it, it builds the souls of the, of the family around them and their friends or, or um, you know, this, the original sin or, or all sorts of theodicies that, that don't affect that individual where some individual gets done over, but for the, for the benefit, for the greater good in to some other people at some other time. I'd say if that's the only reason for it, mm -hmm. then yes, I totally reject those, those theodicies. Now I think better ways to cast out, you know, better ways to develop those theodicies is to say that um, firstly, there are some goods accruing to other people because of it, but also this one person is not thrown under the bus. This person is also uh, redeemed, justified, you know, et cetera. Um, so, but yes, as you described it, I would reject those articulations yeah. of the theodicies. They can almost you what so what you're saying is if as long as there's a person centered theodicy, then these other ones could could be tacked on. Yeah, and they That's might amazing. they might help with the problem as well because there are certain other goods that come about which can um, uh, further I guess at least add to the moral justification that God has for allowing them. Yeah, yeah, interesting. So this all came out from a rabbit hole that we went down talking about experiential knowledge. Oh, so and we also were we were just defining omniscience. So, on this, uh, yeah, yeah, I've just realized that we, goodness. Okay, so rewind on this. It's a good rabbit hole, though. I mean, like, yeah, I, I really right. think, I, love I mean, I, I really, I really think that, um, like, one, it is very, 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 very difficult to respond to certain atheological arguments if you have uh, that kind of eternal conscious torment view. Um, yes. But anyway. so it, I've always, I, I've long said, if I was a Christian, I would be a universalist. It would be the very first thing. Uh, like I have to be a universalist, and actually, I'd have to be an open theist, which means I'd have to believe in libertarian free will. But I couldn't do that, and so therefore, I couldn't be an open theist. But but the only the only way I can make sense of God in, in sort of these classical understandings would be an open theistic um, universalist God. But there you go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, we could probably get on to omnipotence if you're uh, cool yeah. with that. Yeah, go for it. So this one is also, this one's probably the hardest, uh, sorry, I just got to itch my ear. Uh, this one is also probably the hardest to uh, define out of all of them. Yeah. Um, I'll just give two definitions. One of them, uh, kind of simple. It just says God can do anything metaphysically possible that isn't axiologically limiting. And what that means is that God can do anything metaphysically possible that doesn't entail or involve some limit in in the the person who's doing it it doesn't involve or entail some diminishment of their uh, value or it doesn't entail some restriction in their value so um yeah it doesn't it it doesn't entail or involve some limit on the value of the actor so that's one way to define it 
And then the second one. Of course, you had the problems of defining value and from who, you know, but anyway, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't like, <laughs> yeah. okay. Carry. Let's not get down that rabbit hole. But the, the second way is from Alexander Proust and um, Kenny Pierce. And it, it basically says that something is omnipotent just in case it firstly has perfect freedom of will and secondly has a perfect efficacy of will. So a perfect efficacy of will means roughly uh, the ability to realize whatever one wills. So uh, if this thing wills something, then that thing must come about. Its will cannot be frustrated. So that's perfect efficacy of will. And then perfect freedom of will uh, will involve perfect rationality. It'll involve perfect control over one's actions. It'll involve no susceptibility to irrational or imperfect influences, uh, and so on. So those are two different ways to define omnipotence. It's a very difficult thing to define, um, but those are at least reasonable it's, glosses. It's an interesting time to bring in Arthur Schopenhauer, who said man can do what he wills, but he can't will what he wills, which mm. is which could be applied to God here, which is like, yeah, you, we, you can do what you will. So there's that efficacy of will. But actually, what you will is itself constrained. Now, surely, if you're saying that God has all these other characteristics, then actually those characteristics constrain the will as what well, you know, entirely constrain the will. So if, if you are omnibenevolent, then your will can only fit in line with your omnibenevolence, which is why I often say that God is has no, can have no free will because God is entirely constrained by his nature. Uh, and this is where you might get onto definitions of free will. And you could get away with the compatibilist ver version of free will, but libertarian free will just won't won't work here because God is on a railroad track and can't deviate, especially with divine foreknowledge. So if God knows what God's going to do at any future point in time, then that's infallible foreknowledge, and can't, God cannot God can't do what what he hasn't what God cannot do that which is against his own you know infallible foreknowledge. Yeah. So, I mean, with respect to like um, God being in some sense constrained by his nature, like um, it might depend on what we mean by constrained. But but yes, there's a sense in which, uh, you know, God can't do something which is like evil, say, uh, because he's perfectly good. Uh, but I think what they're going to want to say is like, well, yes, God has libertarian free will. That doesn't mean he can just do absolutely anything, but he can do a range of different things within the constraints imposed by his nature. So he still has different options, right? One of them is creating a world. One of them is refraining from creating a world. One of them is creating world A. One of them is creating world B. Lots of the, So he still has different options to choose from. It's just going to have to be options that are compatible with his various other characteristics. So, um, so yes, he does have a range of options. It's just a range of options which are delimited by his, uh, his nature. Now, um, yeah, go on. Well, this gets onto the whole, actually, where we were going to go, which is best possible world creation. So I, I would, I think I disagree with the notion that he has a range of things, because as commonly understood, omnibenevolence means he has to do that which is maximally or optimally or the most or what, however you want to kind of describe it, most loving, caring. And, and that's a very difficult thing to define anyway, and we haven't done that yet, the, the omnibenevolent bit. But... Uh, um, do I have a basis to be able to disagree with your with your range claim? Uh, this is what happened when you had a had a chat with um, what's it was a chat called uh, um, biggest number creator guy. Oh, um, <laughs> I know who you're talking about Michael. Wait, what's his name? No, uh, Adelstein. I think that's his last name. Yeah, yeah. So uh, he's got it. Deliberation under ideal conditions. Yeah. So so this is where he said, "Oh well." He, he he argued that God had to create the best possible world. He actually, it was an argument against God in the, in the end because he said God couldn't create the best possible world, therefore God doesn't exist. So in the same way, he said, like, you get these competitions where you have a competition who can create the biggest number, but there is no biggest number. And so therefore, you know, there is you can do a bigger and bigger number, but you can always do more. And so therefore it all kind of falls apart. Um, I'm taking some shortcuts here but he said like if you, if you look at god creating the most the greatest possible world you can imagine even more loving blah 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 and then you you just can't do that so you're saying god could create a, that god has a range whereas someone else might say there isn't a range there's just the optimal world and and how do you navigate that yeah Sorry. so no no it's all good yeah there are different so there are diff two different ways uh that i think the theist can go one of them is uh, you could appeal to incommensurability. So Alexander Proust talks about this in his paper, Divine Creative Freedom. He talks about this problem of no best world. And you can basically adopt this incommensurability thesis across the range of different worlds. So their value is incommensurate or incommensurable with one another. That means that there's no common metric by which they can be compared. So um, 
for instance, uh, and, and Proust gives a, a bunch of different different like values that a world can instantiate. And he basically argues that it's not clear how you could like even compare one world to another in terms of the values it instantiates to say one is better than the other or to say that one is worse than the other or even that it's equal. It's just there's no common metric by which you can compare them. So for instance, like if you compare the elegance and simplicity and the moral and aesthetic purity of the alone world where God chooses to exist alone versus this kind of dramatic, complex, morally rich unfolding of a cosmic story or drama, like it's just not clear which of those is going to be better or worse. Uh, uh, just because they instantiate such different values and the different kinds of values in there and so on. Both seem pretty valuable, uh, but it's just not clear how we even could compare them. And so then Proust tries to generalize this to other worlds, uh, depending on the unique concoction of goods and bads, as well as kinds of goods and bads that are contained therein, uh, and the kinds of values and disvalues. And so if you have incommensurability on at hand, then um, you could just have an incommensurable array of different worlds that are uh, all like reasonably good worlds, but there's no best one and they can't really be ranked in terms of like a, uh, this one's better than this one, which is better than this one, which is better than this one. Uh, and so that could afford God a different, like a, a wide array of things without having to, um, you know, force him as it were to choose the best because there is no best. It doesn't make any sense to talk about a best. They all can't even be compared with one another. So that's one way to go. Uh, but, there's uh, a... Sorry, sorry. Let's unpick that a little bit because there's so much in there. So, uh, of course, and this talks about how, how the, the, you can have different species and you say this is the best possible world. It depends whether you're a koala or a human or, or you know, this is the incommensurability of, you know, any kind of evaluation. It depends what your viewpoint is. But then, you know, you can just basically it's almost like all loving is meaningless then. It, do you know what I mean? Like omnibenevolence in that kind of scenario is like you say, I, I would question how you how you establish that any given world out of all the options is therefore sufficient. So who, how, where, where's the line of, well, that world's sufficient, that world's not from whose point of view? Because actually from, from a shrimp, that's an awesome shrimp world, but actually it's just really rubbish for humans because they eat humans' faces off or whatever. But, but I, well, how do you draw sufficiency lines there? And really, does this render the idea of omnibenevolence kind of incoherent? I mean, it's a really good question. And I think it kind of just goes to um, underlying commitments about moral realism and irrealism, or more broadly, axiological realism and axiological irrealism. So if we if we do indeed take on a kind of axiological realism, which most theists are going to want to say, where there are, you know, stance independent facts about what's valuable and disvaluable, um, and uh, you know, in terms of aesthetic values, in terms of moral values, in terms of et cetera, uh, then there are going to be facts that God could be attuned to in terms of the value of worlds. And it's not going to be like, what's what's good for the shrimp or what's good for the human? Uh, no, it's just in terms of um, what's good, right? What, what is a good world? And what values does it instantiate from this third person perspective? The, just what are the axiological stance independent truths? And uh, God can survey those and then actualize an appropriate world based on that. So it's not as though, you know, hey, this is a really good world for the shrimp, but not for the human. I mean, no, we're just talking about a world that's good simpliciter uh, or good enough. Simpliciter. No, but that's good good for God. That's God's third, third person view. But then so they're going to reject God's that. Just, yeah. So God's creating a world that's good, good as not maybe not for God, but from God's point of view is is there's something circular about that there's something like i don't know intuitively a bit like i don't know yeah so i mean still... i don't think they're going to want to say it's like good for god there's not really a good for x uh, in in this equation it's just good simpliciter uh that's what they're going to want to say and okay they... well actually so this brings on a problem i wanted to discuss with you which is because i think that doesn't make sense so i think good is goal orientated uh, and so, the, and this is, you're right, all these things depend so much on the baggage you're bringing to the table. Um, and uh, so I say there's no such thing as perfection. You know, when you say something is perfect, you actually, what you're hiding is a load of, you're hiding uh, protasis and apodosis in a, in a conditional statement. So you're saying, like, um, you know, if I want to play rugby, then this ball is perfect for playing rugby but if i want to play football then this ball is not perfect do you know what i mean so so therefore i i, I say perfect and therefore good are, are pretty much goal orientated uh, and therefore i don't i think that just doesn't make doesn't really help the case that you were presenting 
Yeah, well, I mean, the thing is, I think the theist is just going to reject that. So, I mean, yeah, yeah so the theist is going to say, okay, that's your view, but I have a different view of what, what good is. And I mean, you know, um, you know philosophers... And that's defend, why I don't believe in God. Yeah, yeah. well, I mean, philosophers defend, uh, several philosophers defend your kind of view there, that um, goodness only makes sense if it's appropriately related to goals or desires or things like that. But, you know, lots of other philosophers defend views on which that's not the case, right? So yeah. there is, I think, room for reasonable disagreement yeah. in, in that regard. Um, but anyway, that is the first one that you could appeal to, the incommensurability. Uh, if we could go on to the second one, maybe, the second yeah. response to the no best world one. Um, basically, it's to say, uh, yeah, there is no best world. So God isn't, you know, uh, yeah, anyway, it, it's to say that there's no best world. But if there is no best world, then it's no mark against God's perfection that he can't actualize the best world, right? Because there is no best world. Uh, it's simply metaphysically impossible for God to actualize such a world. And so he couldn't have done other than actualize a less than best world. And since ought plausibly implies can, so they'll continue, it follows that it's not the case that God ought to actualize a, uh, er, sorry, it follows that it's not the case that he ought to actualize the best world, and hence he is entirely permitted to actualize a less than best world. That, that's one way that they can go. Basically, uh, can, you, um, can you repeat that again? I, my, my brain is suffering. Yeah. So basically, there's no best possible world. And so it's right. metaphysically impossible for God to actualize the best possible world. Yeah. But if ought implies can, and God can't do something, right? Then it follows that it's not the case that he ought to do it, right? If ought implies right. can and he can't, well, then it follows that it's not the case that he ought. So it's not the case that God ought to create the best possible world because he can't. And if it's not the case that he ought to create the best possible world, then he's permitted in not doing so, right? That's just, that's what it is to say that something, it's not the case that someone ought to do something. That means that they're permitted in not doing it. So how does that play with his om omnibenevolence though? Uh, good question. Um, I think the theist is probably going to say that, uh, you know, he can't just create a really shitty world. You know, it can't just be one where every single creature is tortured for every moment of their lives. So it's got to be at least reasonably, you know, it's got to meet some threshold. Um, so it's got to be at least sufficiently good or it's got to meet some this, low... This is the problem I have. Like when you were discussing it with, with um, deliberation under ideal conditions, it, I, it was this idea of like sufficiency, which appears to me fairly arbitrary and, and vague. You know, what, what denotes a sufficient universe and and then if god was all all loving genuinely all loving so if i'm i can like i can build a, a sufficiently good shed for you joe and it'll do a fairly good job and it'll keep most of your tools in but i could actually build a better shed and if i can build a better shed and i'm like the best shed builder in the world and i pride myself on being the best shed builder oh, i don't want to bring pride into it but you know uh surely that's what I should do. I should, if I can build you a better shed, I should build you a better shed. I, well, not if there's we, no best shed, right? Because you could always have that complaint. But raised but, yeah, but there's a better shed. Yeah, but even if you had made that, right, that same complaint is going to be able to be made. So it's like you're never going to be able to get rid of that complaint, no matter what you can do. And so you can't do otherwise than essentially make a less than less than the best shed but, and so you have to satisfy you're assuming some kind of better as soon as you get to sufficient because you, you're saying this is insufficient and there is this level that's sufficient so god would work towards this but as soon as he gets to this level he just gives up and goes oh well i've got to this bare minimum of sufficiency sod it i'm not going to do any better yeah so i mean i think what the theist is going to say that like at some level then he can just choose among the range from let's say the the number of uh, or anyway, once once you have this threshold of worlds, he's going to be able to choose among the range of any of those uh, above or even at that minimum because it's sufficiently good. Now, you do raise a question, like, does that seem arbitrary? Now, one way they, the theist could go, I don't really recommend this, but one way that they could go is just to say, yeah, there are certain um, just contingent facts like that. Or maybe they could even say that it's a necessary fact. It's just a necessary fact that cuts off here, and there's no explanation for that. You know, sometimes explanations just have to come to an end. You can't explain, 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 ad infinitum. Sometimes explanations just come to an end, and you say, that's that, end of story. So that's one thing they could say. It's not very satisfying. Uh, another thing you could say is, well, um, maybe there is some principled conditions that uh, have to be met. And, you know, we have a kind of reasonable explanation for those. So one of them might be that any creature, any conscious creature that's created has to be such that it like endorses its life. You know, its life is worth living or something like that. We talked about this earlier, that kind of yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, intrapersonal defeat condition. That person has to have their own evils defeated by their own lights. Um, 
And so maybe that's one thing. So even, even for the shrimp that suffer, or I'm not sure shrimp suffer, but let's set that aside. Even for the dog that suffers and so on, like, um, you know, this is getting into kind of Trent Doherty territory where they, we talk about uh, animals that get into an afterlife and kind of can endorse their suffering because their cognitive capacities well, are raised. I think that's the only way that you can you can go with that. Like, uh, yeah, exactly. Know. Yeah, no, I, I, but, but like more generally, though, I think, you know, we can offer a principled reason. Like so long as each creature does indeed have its evils defeated in that way from its own perspective and it endorses its life and it has a life worth living, then that's going to count as a sufficiently good world. And God's going to be... Um, perfectly within his rights of actualizing such a world. And so it's a kind of non-arbitrary cutoff. Um, but it, it demarcates all those worlds that are impermissible for God to create, where there's one or more creatures that don't meet that condition from the worlds that are permissible for God to create uh, the, the, and that are sufficiently good, namely the ones where every creature therein uh, has a life worth living um, by its own perspective. It's just not just punting to the afterlife to solve everything. Like, it's just literally like, uh, oh, my goodness, how do we solve this? Oh, the afterlife has solved it. Because like, uh, that's what it seems to me, you know, genuinely. Like, it's like, oh, this could be how do we how do we get around this sufficiency issue? Well, if we just invent the afterlife afterwards and that can just magically uh, make it make everything right for all sentient creatures, then job done. Yes. Uh, <laughs> um, so, I mean, yeah, I mean, the thing is, like. It, this gets tricky because we're kind of doing worldview comparison and they're going to want to say yeah. that, listen, like by the lights of my worldview, I have principled reasons for pausing this sort of afterlife. It's not some ad hoc pause it like, uh, or like, oh crap, my theory is facing disconfirmation. I better pause it in afterlife to avoid it. No, I mean, like they have reasons they think that there's an afterlife and they have various motivations for that within their worldview and so on. So, I mean, we are getting the tricky territory. Uh, it, I mean, it does seem to be like a, almost like a, yeah, like a, a wild card that you could play at any given moment. Um, so, and I mean, it's, it's, it's quite connected to skeptical theism. So skeptical theism, the idea that we either cannot or, or just don't know the mind of God, which is say, oh, we don't. And it's the possibility, ergo probability fallacy, which is, you know, the, oh, this could conceptually be how it, how it is. Therefore, it's it, probably how it is. Therefore, it's how it is. And, you know, like you, you dream up these, these ad hoc conceptions and then that becomes part of your model because it solves your problems. Yeah. Skeptical theism sometimes can also be used as like a wild card and so, or abused, maybe we could say. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, like what the theist is, again, what the theist is probably going to want to say is like, no, I mean, listen, within the perspective of my worldview, I actually do have certain like motivations that aren't ad hoc for having these sorts of things. Now, one thing to note is that this might lower the, uh, the, the overall probability of their worldview because they're adding on certain theoretical baggage and ontological baggage from having to postulate this this afterlife where uncertain stuff occurs so i mean that is one thing that could be said in response to this sort of approach it's like well okay even if you do have certain motivations within your worldview for allowing this and so even if i grant that it's not ad hoc it's still lowering the probability of your hypothesis just because you're adding all this theoretical baggage concerning what firstly that there is an afterlife secondly what it's like certain facts about its intrinsic character and so on so that's i think that's the best way for the uh, a theologian like yourself to respond <laughs> yeah it's interesting you you mentioned uh you kind of hinted at the munchausen trilemma so the munchausen trilemma uh, is is the fact that um if you want to ground anything anything rationally you you have three options one you can ground it in a circle which is a equals a because of b b because of c uh, c because of a and then so that's or you do the infinite regress a because of b because of c because of d blah 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 uh, or you just have a brute fact so an axiom which is a self supposedly a self uh, self-evident truth um what, what do you say to those three options and what would be preferred and is it a case of where well, you can't really prefer any it's just like you've got what <laughs> you've got one of those three like it will lump it yeah. Um, so yeah, this this kind of trilemma appears in lots of different areas of philosophy. So it kind of just depends. Sometimes it crops up when you're talking about explanation, right? So what is the explanatory structure of reality? Does it go in a circle? Um, does it go ad infinitum? Or is it just linear and it goes to a particular stopping point? At which case, you know, that thing is not further explained. So it comes up in the context of explanation. It also comes up in the context of justification, right? So what justifies our beliefs? Well, this belief is justified by this belief or consideration. This just this belief or consideration is justified by this belief or just or consideration. Uh, does that go on infinitely, or does it come to a, a finite end, or does it loop back around on itself? So it comes up in lots of different contexts, and uh, one's answer might might vary by context. At least for me, I generally 
prefer that option where it's just a, a linear line and then it gets to a stopping point. I generally think that that's the best out of the three, usually. At yeah, least. yeah um, I'd agree. Yeah. And uh, Plantinga would talk about properly basic belief as maybe being that, that you just like, it's almost a brute fact belief. Yeah, yeah. Well, exactly. And well, uh, we we don't have to take on all of his baggage about proper functionalism. I mean, we could just recognize that uh, we don't have infinitely many beliefs. <laughs> So our at least in terms of our justified beliefs, they have to come to a stopping point at some some place. Mm. Uh, and and maybe that one is either self-justifying, that's kind of implausible by my lights. Maybe um, or maybe it's just like appropriately connected to the fact that is known or the fact that is uh its intentional object, right? So like maybe I have a certain perceptual belief and it's based on my seeing you or something like that. Um and then uh that itself isn't further justified by belief. It's just appropriately related to you causally or something like that, right? So it's just, uh, that's one way you could go. It's like, it's not further justified by like a belief or an explicit consideration, but it's actually just like appropriately latching on to the fact out there in the world. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, and it, I suppose this is somewhat connected to, uh, let's take William Lane Craig because he's uh, he's always good for uh, discussing uh, his idea that uh, well religious experience like the importance of religious experience. He said the the inner witness of the Holy Spirit is foundational to his belief, uh, and you know we can talk about fideism against evidentialism. So you know just uh, uh, you can maybe talk about those terms and and what do you think about religious experience? Uh, you know in in that kind of in that William in that Craigian manner. Yeah, good question. So, I mean, I think I generally tend to think that if things appear to someone as being some way, then they're at least justified in taking things to be that way, unless they have some defeater. And so if... Is that, so, is that phenomenal conservatism? Broadly, yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's, it's actually quite popular among a professional epistemologists. Now, you might have certain caveats, and you might say that there are certain domains where this doesn't apply. But at least, broadly speaking, um, I find I'm sympathetic to, the, to this kind of view. Uh, without it, it's, it's quite difficult to diffuse skepticism, actually. But OK, set that aside. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think, I think religious experience, uh, now there's a caveat on this. I think religious experience, yes, actually can rationally justify people in believing what they, you know, believing their appearances, believing what uh, their experiences reveal to them, as it were. Uh, but this is a little caveat. Uh, the justification that it confers on them is defeasible. That is, it can be overturned or overridden or defeated by countervailing considerations. And lo and behold, in the case of religious experience, there are quite a lot of countervailing considerations. <laughs> um, you know, uh, for starters, we have the massive disagreement among the various different religious traditions in terms of even what they experience, right? So, I mean, in general, we don't trust um, testimonies of experience. We don't trust them if they radically diverge from one another. So if someone, if like five people came up to you who were at a concert and one of them said they saw nothing on the stage, another one said they saw three donkeys on the stage, another one said they saw like a big shark tank on the stage and there was a big performance and the sharks were jumping and so on. And, you know, this is all supposed to be happening at the same time. And, you know, another one said that there was like a band playing, you know, a mariachi band. And, you know, they were like, -ba -ba. <laughs> whatever, whatever the heck, you know, mariachi bands do. Uh, right. Now, what are you going to believe in this case? Uh, I think it's pretty obvious that you're at least, you're probably just going to suspend judgment. Like, listen, I don't know what happened. Um, and I'm not going to trust any one of your individual testimonies precisely because they radically diverge from one another. And I don't have any reason for preferring one of yours as opposed to the other. And even if you went to that that thing and you you saw some experience of yours and you thought it was, let's say, uh, a dog, there's just one dog on the stage, you're probably, once you hear all these other people who are in equally good position as you, and they all radically diverge from yours, you're probably going to start to really question yours, at least I would. So I think that this radical divergence gives a defeater for the relevant uh, deliverances of the experience. Um, now, yeah, I mean, it does depend on certain empirical matters, like how much disagreement is there? Uh, what's the nature of the disagreement? Is it just over certain minor interpretational difficulties? Or is it like in really substantial central facts about the experience itself? Um, and I mean, a lot of them tend to say that they know they actually experience like an impersonal absolute reality. And you know, theists are gonna be like, Oh, crap, <laughs> God is supposed to be personal. <laughs> so like, that can't be a reliable experience, uh, yeah. you know, etc. So like they do, re oftentimes, they do seem to radically diverge in their character. Um, and, and of course, the specificity of the of the experience in terms of the God and the plurality of religions, uh, you know, the mutually exclusive, uh, you know, God, God, gods, it makes it rather problematic. 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, another thing, another potential defeater is certain, and I don't think this is going to apply to every belief, but um, every religious ex every religious belief based on religious experience, but it applies to a lot of them, is that there are going to be certain quote-unquote debunking explanations. And by that, I just mean explanations of the experience that are far simpler and that, it, you know, that explain why exactly they had that experience and when they had it. And it's a far simpler and seemingly better explanation. So, you know, when uh, the evangelical uh, senses the presence of God or something, when they're in, you know, this, this uh, um, worship service and, you know, the lights are dim, the music is playing, you know, and like we have various psychological mechanisms that we just know um, are able to produce these sorts of experiences uh, in totally different contexts. And like, we, that's a simpler explanation that, you know, your belief is solely a function of those various mundane facts and not of actually latching on to a divine being or something along those lines um, that could provide a defeater for uh, the, the relevant experience. Now, you have to be careful with this because, yes, yeah, sometimes, I mean, like, listen, I'm having an experience of you, but there are certain brain mechanisms that could be a hallucinatory mechanism, right, that could produce that as well. So I, but again, we have to ask what's the best explanation there. Those are actually quite mm -hmm. rare. Um, I've been a pretty in sound mind and sound, you know, things like that. And, um, I'm speaking at least relatively competently, et cetera, you know, things like that. Um, so it, you just have to kind of run which is the best explanation. And I would argue that actually in at least lots of cases of religious experience, the better explanation comes in terms of one of these debunking explanations where it's an explanation of your having the experience at the time you had it and the way that you had it without invoking it actually latching on to God or something like that. So I've got a lot of time for these abductive arguments. These inference is the best explanation. Paul Draper does this a lot. Uh, and I think they're very good. But I guess that when you've got a whole, you know, kind of Bayesian way, when you're bringing to the table in evaluating two hypothes hypotheses, uh, a background knowledge that includes a whole lot of stuff that's not in my background knowledge, then this is this is where you get completely divergent Bayesian analyses, uh, evaluations of, of hypotheses is because you're both bringing to the table two completely different background knowledges. Mm -hmm. and, you know, it's trying to un unpick that. Yeah. I guess. Um, so you, we talked uh, talked a little bit about phenomenal conservatism, which is this idea, intuition, if you like, just like um, it, absent of any defeaters, if I intuitively, you know, believe this is true, then this is probably true type thing. Very simply, very badly put. But um, it's, it's used by uh, religious people quite a lot, actually, of phenomenal conservatism. But it's, it's interesting. Uh, philosopher, is it Michael Humer? Um, yeah. uses uses it to uh, attack uh, gratuitous evil in 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 the context of the problem of evil, which is to say that do you know what um, predation and the fact that this fawn has uh, has died in a forest fire for three for three over a three day period, or that water buffalo has been ripped apart by um oh, that's not predation uh, water buffalo has been ripped apart by a, a pride of lions while it's alive and all this kind of th thing. You say right, it doesn't look like that needs to happen. This looks gratuitous, so absent of any defeaters i don't really have any defeaters that is that is gratuitous evil but the theist then says well it could be a reason but then there could be unicorns like skeptical point uh, i guess i want to make is that skeptical theism is not a good i think defeater for this kind of phenomenal conservatism would you agree yeah so that's a, a really uh, complex issue that i haven't studied all that much like the interplay because i know that there are certain papers on this that i haven't read uh so i have to be a little bit tentative here but I, I'm actually, yeah, sympathetic with that that point from um, from humor. It's like oftentimes people don't recognize that phenomenal conservatism is a double-edged sword. So it's like, you know, theists will often wield it on behalf of a lot of their premises or conclusions, but like they fail to recognize that like, hey, you know, maybe this like eternal conscious torment, you know, it seems to most people to be like obviously morally impermissible. So like maybe we can use phenomenal yeah. conservatism to justify that. Or like, hey, this evil over here kind of seems like obviously unjustified. Uh, you know, like so people and, and then in turn, atheists will say those things, but then they'll just completely discount uh, so the seemings of religious people or their religious experiences without having to provide any defeaters. They're like, oh, no, that's just they'll just dismiss them. So on, on both sides, sometimes they uh, they try to use appeal to seemings, but uh, they're not really consistent in it. So I'd urge consistency. But but in, in, long story short, I, I'm sympathetic with the point that you just made based on what humor has said. Um, and, and, you know, the task then would be on the theist to provide some defeater for that. Or yeah, to, so to somehow they might try to argue that you don't actually have that seeming. You're just mistaking that your seeming with something else. So they might say what you're really seeming is 
what you really have a seeming of or an intuition of is the very, very, very strong badness of this. But you don't have the seeming of that badness not being connected with an outweighing good. Um, they might say that kind of outstrips your um, your seeming faculty. I know. I'd just say, well, that seems bullshit. But, <laughs> yeah. No, no, sorry. Um, I don't want to be facetious. No, because, yeah. And but uh, so Thule, a philosopher, um, he so you talk about like are there absent of defeaters and a theist will often come back and say well there are defeaters for this uh like the seemingness of this being gratuitous evil and that is the you know the ontological argument is a defeat to that but then Thule says actually no you can't bring in these generic um theistic arguments that have no moral dimension mm. so the ontological argument doesn't really have a moral it doesn't say anything about uh pain and suffering and so therefore yeah. he, he says quite, quite well that actually, no, those aren't defeaters. And, and there are very few uh, theistic arguments that have a moral dimension. Yeah. So I, I'm not sure. I mean, I'd have to probably read Thule. I, I've read some of Thule, but I probably have to, it was a long while back. So I'd probably have to go like read him again in order to be able to arbitrate on this, honestly. But I just did want, did want to say that, uh, you know, uh, I just read that from the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy entry on either f f um, conservative, uh, phenomenal uh, conservatism or or um, problem of evil. I can't remember. Oh, which nice. One, yeah. 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 That's interesting. I should probably read that. I was just going to say, like, firstly, like, OK, you can appeal to some highfalutin theistic argument that firstly fails. But set that aside. You can also appeal to atheistic arguments, you know, like when the the. Uh, like, if you truly think that that's a way to defeat these experiences, you can also say, like, okay, cool, you had a religious experience, bam, problem of evil, bam, hiddenness, you know, like, just bring out these completely irrelevant arguments. It's like, oh, well, uh, you know, there are these so other that's arguments. Great, that's a great, yeah, I like that. I hadn't seen the uh, parallel uh, parallelism there, or mm -hmm. the parallels there. That's so, really um, before, before we go on to a next point, I probably just have about 10 minutes left, so. Okay, uh, right, uh, goodness me. Um, okay. Uh, well, if we want to do Q and A, I could stretch it to fifteen minutes. It's just um, my family. If anyone dinner. has, yeah, yeah, yeah my yeah, family's yeah. having dinner, and I, I'm going to be a little bit late to it. It's dinner in the house, so it's not going out. So it's okay if I'm a little bit late. But I, I have probably fifteen minutes. Okay. If anyone has any questions, please get them in. Um, uh, any super chats would be really, really super appreciated. But any questions would be great uh, for Joe to answer. I guess if we've only got fifteen minutes. Just a really quick. Uh, one that it, in reading your book, uh, there's a massive chapter on scientism. You take a you take a a big pop at uh, scientism. Um, would you really quickly want to explain scientism? And then uh, there's just one point I wanted to, uh, clarification with. Yeah, so uh, scientism is basically the view that uh, science is really our only path to knowledge, right? Like science, the scientific method, the deliverances of science. That's really the only reliable way that we can come to know things. And what is science? Well, it's something like uh, the description, investigation, and explanation of the physical world, uh, inquiry into the physical world that is principally based on the deliverances, whether direct or indirect, of uh, sensory experience. Uh, thank you for the, putting those messages up. I saw them. Uh, so uh, yeah, so that's really what, what science is. It's all about the deliverances, whether directly or indirectly, of sensory experience, and basically what we can uh, come to know about the physical world through those deliverances of sensory experience. Um, and yeah, I mean, there are, as I detail in my book, there are about 13 billion problems with scientism. Um, I mean, listen, I love science. Don't get me wrong. You know, there are a bunch of strengths of science, right? It's pretty obvious what its strengths are. It uncovers truths about the empirical physical world around us. Um, it also gives us insight into the physical world's deep structure. It, it allows us to predict, control, and systematize our observations. Uh, it helps with technological and medicinal developments, etc. But science is rather obviously limited in various ways. Um, firstly, uh, it only uses a small set of regimented epistemic tools, right? It uses our um, principally our sense experience, but of course we also have different ways to come to knowledge, like rational intuition. That's precisely how we know mathematical truths, which are the foundation of science. Uh, like how we know that one plus one equals two, how we know that uh, how equality works and how we know how addition and multiplication and so on work, et cetera. Um, as well as various other mundane ways that we come to know like memory and just reasoning in general, right? You can't use some kind of scientific experiment to prove the reliability of memory or reason because you'd have to use memory and reason in doing that experiment. Um, 
And also, you know, so firstly, science is limited in the epistemic tools that it wields. And secondly, it's limited in um, what it can investigate. So there are aspects of reality that outstrip science's ability to investigate. So f you might think that there are abstract objects. Uh, science really isn't uh, in the business of probing those abstract objects because they're not really physical objects. But, you know, more, more uh, intimately are private mental states. Um, so, you know, uh, the felt aspects of conscious experience, right? You, you just have a kind of direct access to them. Uh, and then we know what we're thinking right now without having to perform some kind of scientific experiment or anything like that. Um, so yeah, there are different aspects of reality that outstrip science's abilities to uh, probe and uncover. Uh, so yeah. I love that. Like, I love science, but it sounds like uh, I'm not racist, but <laughs> do, do you know what I mean? Whenever, like, whenever, whenever someone says that about racism, you should immediately, of course, immediately of course. stop it's listening. A classic, it's a classic. Um, I love science, but science sucks. Uh, no, yeah. um, but but no, I, I actually get your point. So in in, in your book, you, you take scientism, which is a very like um, full on science is the only way of of you know arriving at uh, rationally arriving at knowledge, which is rational. Yeah. Anyway, uh, but one of the things you say is like you know. It's science versus philosophy, and and I just wanted to say I I I find that a bit problematic, and I know I know what you're saying, but of course, for me, and what well, am I wrong? It's science to me is is in this context is an epistemological method, and therefore science just is just a subset of philosophy, and so you got this idea that uh, you know it's not pitting science against philosophy because science is philosophy, and then maybe the scientists, some people who are science not scientists scientismists um uh you know maybe maybe don't maybe need to un maybe need to realize that as well so i was just wondering you know any thoughts on actually science is just philosophy you know as it used to be called you know natural philosophy yeah well i think it ultimately just kind of depends on how we categorize these things like honestly i don't think there's like a mind independent you know us independent fact of the matter about which fields fall under which fields, you know, precisely. So it's like, uh, um, I say that that's kind of a, a humanly constructed thing. So I mean, it, it sort of depends on how we define the things people can define philosophy differently. And under some definitions, uh, I, I agree with you, science would fall under it under some definitions, but under other definitions, you know, it won't. So yeah, well, that's such such it's so annoying that we don't have the time because actually that leads perfectly onto nominalism and abstract objects and and the the idea you said a very nominalistic thing there which is you know it just depends how we like cut these things up and define them and I you know which is opposed to essentialism which says these things have essences and and you know and some kind of realism and I am a conceptual nominalist but I don't know that you are particularly and that would have been a really interesting conversation but we have to that'll have to wait for another day. Um, uh any any quick thought you've done a big video like chatting about uh oh yeah with, so uh... i do recommend oh yeah i did have um dr kenny boyce he is a staunch yeah. fictionalist nominalist uh so i i recommend people checking that out for the nominalist case but i also go through some arguments for propositions and other things like that and other abstract objects on my channel so they could just check out my god and abstract objects playlist um i go through a lot of that in there um yeah i mean i guess uh I lean realist with respect to at least certain abstract objects, right? I mean, like there are a bunch of different purported abstract objects that some philosophers believe in. Some of those I don't believe in, but other ones I find plausible. So like propositions, for instance, I think they can play a really good explanatory role within our ontology, um, et cetera. So. Uh, just really very quickly, um, uh, before I do the quick fire questions for you at the end, which is just questions to get to know you. And I haven't talked about Arsenal yet, which is obviously a bit of a problem. No, it's not. I love Arsenal actually. So there you go. Um, so uh you, you talked about net goods and if you could argue that and best possible worlds and what what would go create i'm writing a book with dr aaron adair at the moment on the impact on uh theology and religion if we found intelligent uh extraterrestrial intelligence in the universe now uh the uh, the problem of evil uh if we if we find um, and this is called the Copernican principle, which is to say that if we're going to be somewhere in the middle on average to, if we're going to do a statistical analysis. So um, if there is intelligent alien life out there and perhaps billions of, of instances of it, uh, they are going to have suffering, let's assume, and they're going to have suffering that's far worse than ours. So in other words, you're not is you're increasing the, the amount of suffering and the type of suffering, you know, uh, uh, out there now. What would you say? Uh, the one question I want to say before I get into the multiverse quest question really quickly is Do you think that impacts the probability of God existing? Just finding more amounts of suffering, does that lower the probability of God existing? Or does theodicy solve it all? 
you know, it's so if it solves it on Earth, it solves it everywhere type thing. Yeah, so uh, I do think, like, especially if we found worse kinds and types of evil, that would make the problem of evil worse. And I think it uh, increased the evidential case for, for atheism, yes. Um, yeah, Brilliant. because that, I mean, certain, awesome. certain theodicies are like highly dependent on, you know, like certain goods that might come about like from us undergoing suffering. Like we can soul, gr you can build our souls, we can grow in relationships with one another, etc. But like, if we find out that this character, the character of the suffering on this other planet is far worse than ours, and it doesn't actually allow for those things, then a lot of these, these ap appeals are going to kind of fall to the wayside. Um, now, of course, you could bring in the afterlife, but again, um, you're adding auxiliary hypotheses and you're just decreasing the probability of your hypothesis. So either way, there's still some probabilistic gain to, to, um, to atheism, I think. Fascinating. I was going to say that if, if the only evil we had in this world was stubbing your toe, you could, I think you could intuitively very easily argue that God exists. And, and yeah, it's, it's just intuitively more difficult. Well, it's just more difficult given the extra arguments you've got to add to, to justify genocide. Um, so therefore, I think if you just extrapolate that into the universe, then yeah, it's a problem. Um, so the multiverse, if this universe has a net good, and this is the, I wanted to tie this together with what you're saying about best possible worlds and sufficient worlds and blah, blah, blah. But if if God, and this is some theists use this to argue for a multiverse, it, 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 if, if, if this universe creates a net good, then is God not... Um, you know, obliged to, and I know that's a problem. Some people say God doesn't have obligations, but is God not obliged with his own characteristics to, to produce infinite amounts of a net good? So multiverse full of loads more of this. Uh, that sounds kind of consequentialistic. So, I mean, if the theist doesn't accept consequentialism, I think they could say, no, I mean, God isn't obliged to make more and more good. I mean, you know, uh, it's, it's omnibenevolent. Yeah, but I mean, like a couple can, you know, produce two children. They're not like obliged to like always max, you know, have more and more and more and more children, like do the good and good, more and more good. As long as they love the children that they do have and they give them a good life and so on. I mean, I think that there's nothing, uh, there's nothing that impugns their moral character if they just do that. So similarly, um, but I then, think so, long so as... Christians shouldn't go out and make more Christians. It's like, well, well, like that's should... I mean, that certainly among the people that already exist. I mean, again, it depends on literally make more quiverful like have more children well you can make more children with not having to like infinitely make more and more and more, more children right so like we can have like a reasonable middle ground here so it's like sure maybe christians uh within their own ethic are like obliged or something like if they're a married couple and they you know they can uh, afford having a child or something like that you know maybe they're obliged to, to bring a few into existence but they don't have to keep on going and going and maximizing and maximizing um and similarly, you might just say, like, so long as God perfectly loves the creatures that he has created, he's not obliged to, like, make more and more and more and just, like, maximize utility. Because um, that's just, they're going to they're gonna want to say that's not how morality works. It's not maximizing utility. Ah, interesting. I mean, I'd, I'd like to challenge that and discuss that, but we haven't got time. Okay, any super chats? Get them in right now uh, or, or, or last minute things to say to Joe. I wanted to say this to you, Joe, uh, that, that uh, let me share this. I saw these two comments on... Um, uh, where are they? Oh, I can't share them then. It's not allowing me to share that, so I won't share it. Uh, but I will read them to you. So these are comments on your last video. Uh, this comment made me laugh. I don't like hero worship, but I really feel like calling Joe my hero. Um, what do you say to that? Uh, all I say you, is that I, uh, I I laugh. That that's all I'm going to say. I mean, uh, you, I don't. You've won. You, you've won. <laughs> you've won life. <laughs> No, I'm, I'm just going to laugh. I think it's a funny comment. Um, yeah. And this one, when God gives you free will and you use it to support Arsenal, why, Joe? So this this gives you the this gives you the opportunity to say, why do you support Arsenal? And ah, because uh, we're by far the greatest team the world has ever seen, and it's ours. No, okay. Um, you yeah, know, uh, I I watched them play in like 2009 or something like that when I was just getting into professional football a uh, soccer yeah uh when i was just not getting soccer, into soccer, yeah soccer. i know it is kind of gross um but yeah when i was just watching professional football and i uh, i absolutely love the way that they played uh especially mesmerizing was Cesc fabregas he kind of made me fall in love with the beautiful game uh just the way that he played uh in fact ever since i was younger when we were on different travels travel football teams um we were able to pick our numbers essentially just kind of depending on well 
you know, if you had two people pick the same number, then it was difficult. But I forget how they solved that. But uh, I always picked the number four because of Cesc Fabregas. I, I love the way that he played. It was just mesmerizing. It was, it was beautiful. I'm a center attacking midfielder, so um, it's pretty much exactly where he played. Uh, and yeah, I mean, I just really like their style of play. It was kind of like a tiki taka. It was like the English version of Barcelona, right? So like, how could you not love that? Um, well, you should have seen it back in the days of the unbeatables and Emmanuel uh, Petit, Patrick Vieira, uh, Overmars, yeah. Bergkamp. You know, that was that was my that was my time. Uh, I'm a Portsmouth fan, so there you go. Oh wow, you okay. You can't win everything. Uh, <laughs> so th thanks for that. And and th so these these are my quick fire questions. You can't think about these, and then then we're done. Thank you so much, and thank you to Mitch. Uh, Mazarol, um, I believe, uh, French pronunciation. Thank you both. Thank you, Mitch. Thank you for supporting the channel. It's really important. It allows me to keep doing this. So I honestly can't thank you enough. Um, quick fire questions. Favorite fiction book? I bet you don't Brave. get a chance to read anymore. Brave, Brave New World. Yeah, no, I don't really get to read that, but I love, I love Brave New World. Favorite nonfiction book? Oh, boy. Um, probably The Atlas of Reality. It's a comprehensive guide to metaphysics because I love metaphysics and it's a really helpful book. So. Nice one. Uh, the Atlas of Reality. Mm -hmm. or Atlas too. Yeah, nice one. Uh, favorite TV uh, Favorite TV show? Uh, sorry, man. I don't watch TV. Uh, okay. So, favorite movie? Favorite movie, The Arrival. Uh, I really like that one. Interesting. So mm -hmm. Carl Sagan, um, is it not? No, so Carl Sagan wasn't in that one, but it does have to do with, like, you know, Space it's, it's, or it's first contact. It's a first contact film. I can't remember who. Oh, I thought, yeah, it's not Carl Sagan, but it's a first contact film, like Contact. Yeah. Um, uh, so, uh, okay, you are um, you're you're just about to be executed for being an agnostic, and a bunch of angry atheists are going to like take you out for that. Uh, you're allowed your last supper. What would it be? What would your final meal be? Well, what I put? Oh my goodness! Uh, probably glazed salmon. I love glazed salmon for some reason. It's so good. Ooh la la. Uh, and uh, what what would be your superhero power? What would be your superpower if you have it? Only one? Uh, oh, probably omniscience, uh, if that's a superpower. But uh, if we're not counting... Like, oh, there's no glory of learning then. Yeah, yeah, that is true. But still, like, uh, that's true. But but yeah. Um, okay, maybe, uh, maybe flying. <laughs> I'm flying then just just i love flying yeah. um oh uh, brilliant uh so you you uh if you could be given a compliment what compliment would you like to be given what i love your uh no i mean so in people in real life especially when they say this i'm like whoa that really sticks with me uh if they say like i love your channel or if they yeah. say like i love your papers or your books or, you know or something like that um that really uh Makes my validation day. of who you are yeah yeah, yeah well, absolutely. Not even that, but it's okay, like no, they're, they're appreciating my work and i, I it just yeah. i love that yeah absolutely um if you could see a band dead or alive uh who who would it be that you haven't seen before dead or alive so easily yeah. the beatles if i could okay. and uh last question so you are just about to have your face eaten off by a horde of philosophical zombies the pea zombies are in town and they it's all right they don't really know what they, they don't really experience it but they are going to eat your face so you get a chance to run down into your pre pre prepared bunker and you have time to take three people with you you can't take friends or family which three people would you hang out with for a month in a bunker <laughs> oh man um josh rasmussen is one of them uh Graham Oppie oh. is another. So Rasmussen oh. and Oppie. And then, you know, someone's got to make it fun. So we have to have some sort of comedian. Um, no, you know what? Uh, I'd need to play soccer with someone. So forget the comedian. I'd bring in uh, probably Messi. Oh, he's gone for Messi. Yeah. He'll, he'll he'll be bored for so much of that time, though. He'll be and he'll be annoying you because he'll be kicking a ball against the wall, right, for like hours while you three are involved in some debate. And he'll say he'll keep saying, "Oh, please, Joe, come and play with me. Come and play with me, Joe. Please, Joe, come and play yes, with me." Exactly. You go later, Messi, like a child swatting him away. Go, We're talking God. Shut yes. up. Exactly. Exactly. Awesome source. Well, look, uh, thank you, Joe. It's, it's been that too pleasure. Um, I I have got. I can share this with people because I got rid of it. Um, and this is where people can find you. Um, uh, please do so, everyone. Uh, here is uh, Joe's blog, although I think you put more on your, your YouTube channel than your blog. Is that oh, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I very rarely. My, my blog is for responses to my work, usually. 
right. Uh, so it, his YouTube channel, which is Majesty of Reason, please check it out. Loads of absolute stonkingly good content. Uh, there's 100 plus arguments for God, 12 hour long video. You can see how far I've got through it, uh, about about an hour. Uh, and a half um uh so but the, uh, uh, some absolutely fantastic content on there please check out majesty of reason and his book very reasonably priced book if you want to uh get your uh get your head into to some uh, pro hardcore philosophy there uh, the majesty of reason um so please check him out um thank you so much and thank you so much to dustin that's really really generous i can't i can't thank you enough and if you guys want to join the channel as people like um uh, so back in the in the in the chat, uh, Lord of the Four Corners and James Apperson and other people who are members of the channel, vaguely agnostic. That would be absolutely wonderful. Thank you, Dustin. Really, really appreciate that. Um, do you have any final words to say before you go and get your probably not glazed salmon, but some form of? It uh, is sustain? not glazed salmon, unfortunately. But yes, yeah, some form of uh, food. Uh, no, I mean, I guess my final word is thank you for this conversation. I think what you're doing is very valuable. And I think that, yeah, lots of people can really be served by listening to these conversations. And, you know, regardless of whether or not they fall on the same side as you or me, I hope that, you know, they can at least learn to think critically about these sorts of issues by listening to us and, and so on. So thank you uh, for this conversation and your uh, your channel. Excellent. Thank you so much. And and right back at you. And uh, the last thing I have to say is, you know, are your parents proud of the fact that you're not Catholic? Awkward. uh well are they even aware of it that's the that's the real question <laughs> yeah, no, oh so God. that's that's a different story really like you've uh, got this youtube channel yeah, and yeah, they're not, they're not... Oh, yeah they are very old i'm the youngest of four and yeah so i'm i'm the baby so they're uh they're quite old so they're not really uh in tune with all this stuff but uh yeah so for more on that check out my wow. discussion on the channel the non-alchemist uh just look up yeah. on go up to the search bar right Let's now type the non-alchemist joe schmid and it'll pop up and you'll be able to hear more about that. I saw, I saw that I saw that when I was uh, having a look around and I haven't listened to it. So I will go and check that out. That's really cool. Well, look, mate, thank you so much. Thank you to all the uh, listeners and watchers, viewers and talkers, uh, movers and shakers. Please uh, like, subscribe and do all the stuff that YouTube people say that you should do. Uh, but I am a YouTube person. I'm telling you to do it. Uh, thanks for all your support. If you want to join, please uh, do. If you if you can and are able, please um that means the same thing and and desire to uh you can always give thanks uh but the main thing is just watch and enjoy and uh please go and even though i'm a tiny channel compared to uh, joe's check out majesty of reason absolutely amazing anyway joe massive thanks go and have some food really appreciate that everyone else doodle pips all right oh wait i'll just wait for you to